set my mind on sin freeness on sin freeness I have set my mind on righteousness on Christ's righteousness and he I have set my mind on sin freeness, on sin freeness. I have set my mind on holiness, on holiness. I have set my mind on graciousness, on Jesus' graciousness. And when I seek to keep God's law, I see within heaven's open door. I have set my mind on sin freeness on jesus sin freeness and when i look by faith to thee i see your love that saves me i have seen I have set my mind on the love of Yah, on the love from Thusia. I have set my heart on my Savior, on Yahweh my Savior. And when I live Jesus' love in me. And when I look by faith to thee, I see your love that saves me. I have seen the heavenly I have set my mind on sin freeness, on sin freeness. Grace and peace, everyone. Good night. 
I am Sister Ashley Lee Ian, and I have with me here Brother Joel Lee Ian and Please Brother Kwame Thomas. We are from the Thusia Seventh Day Adventist Church in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. So, grace and peace to the Virgin that are coming online. Grace and peace to everyone, those who would join this live later on or see this live at a later point in time. Thank you for joining us. And please, as we're about to discuss this topic tonight, play, pay careful attention. I have an echo. Does anybody else hear me with an echo? I'm not. Try refreshing. I, I am hearing you well. Mm -hmm. Is anybody any live hearing me with an echo? Grace and peace, sister Dachel, Grace and peace, brother Omari, brother Fran, sister Cheryl, sister Agnes, sister Kathy, sister Dublin, sister Adriana, sister Adana. Grace That's and peace. Okay, here and clear. Very nice. So please let us start tonight's session with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving, merciful, Father, divine nature, which art in heaven, ministering your divine character to us, revealing your divine nature, revealing the plan of salvation that we may be saved away from our sins. We thank you, O oh God, for your self nonness love towards us, in providing the science of salvation so that we could be saved away from our formation of sins, so that we could be free from sin. We ask you for a sin-free experience here now, tonight, as we're about to discuss these eternal truths, because apart from you, we do not know anything. We cannot come up with these precious truths on our own. So we do ask you for your indwelling in our hearts, showing us principles of truth, revealing principles of truth unto us, putting in our hearts and in our mouths the right words to speak so that we could help others to, un to come to a knowledge of these truths so that they could be prepared for the coming conflict. We live in a world where Satan is wrought with the woman and he is making war with the remnant of her seed and He's put in so many errors out there to lost people with these errors so that they could never come to a knowledge of the truth. And you have called us to work with you and for you to help people to know the truth that they could be saved. So please be with us in a special way as we discuss these things. These are the mercies we ask of you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so grace and peace once again, Sister Azul. Okay, Brother Omari. Um, Brother Maiden, Brother Kendall, thank you for joining us. Please help us to share the life and tag others, right? So, tonight, we are discussing the social kingship of Christ and the false justification of the world. The social kingship of Christ and the false justification of the world. Now, let's start off. We want to start off in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Sorry, Brother Michael. Grace and peace. Brother Michael is here. Grace and peace, Brother Michael. Grace and peace, Sister Warren. Thank you for joining us, Brother Yakini. So, Second Timothy chapter 3. Paul warned us about a false justification that will exist in the end. A false justification that would exist as a solution to prevailing immorality. Let's look at that in Second Timothy chapter 3. And let's start from verse 1. So it tells us this. It says, let me put this up here, right? It says, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. So we are told 
in the last days and we are living in the last days and what we are to expect is what perilous times trouble sometimes so anybody who is living in in a little bubble and you're thinking that you, you sit and you fantasize that in the your next few months or probably next year or, the ne or your next few years upon this earth would be a peaceful one you need to wake up it, 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 you, you're wasting mental energies fantasizing about a peaceful life on this earth and when i say peaceful i'm so i'm speaking peaceful in, in terms of circumstances and events and the state of the world because we know that true justification we could have psychological peace as we face the event but when it comes to the state of the world it's we are told it's going to be perilous so you might as well make up your mind that things are going to get worse make up your mind to face that stop castle building Stop fantasizing about a peaceful state of things. The Bible tells you that your life on this earth, the things that you're going to face in your environment, is going to be perilous, is going to be troublesome. And it tells you why. Verse 2 onwards, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. You hear that? You see why? The times get perilous. Men are lovers of their own selves. What is that? That is the carnal mind. That is selfishness. You can never envision a peaceful state of things in this world when the thing that is prevailing is the selfishness of the carnal mind. Because when the selfishness of the carnal mind prevails, what peaceful state of affairs do you expect to have? No. Stop castle building. Set your affections on things that are above. There is where your castle is. So, men shall be lovers of what? Their own selves. They don't care about you. They don't have your best interest at heart. The moment, when someone has the carnal mind, the only thing they care about, and that's not really care, but the only thing they think about benefit or profiting is themselves. And we are told, what else? As a result of men having the carnal mind and being selfish, what happens? They are covetous. You think that they are doing things for you to benefit? No, it's for them to be benefit because why? They are covetous. Boasters. They only seek to exalt themselves. They are proud. A wrong estimation of themselves. Blasphemers. You find yeah, some years ago, people would, wouldn't dare say certain things. But now it's like, we have witnessed people blaspheming, saying things about Jesus Christ, like so why, why he didn't come down from the cross and save himself. We have we have witnessed those things recently on social media. Blaspheming Christ, blaspheming Christianity, men saying that they have more sins to go and commit still. Blasphemers disobedient to parents you want to know why children are becoming worse and worse and worse is the carnal mind selfishness and the more children practice selfishness they deteriorate when it comes to obeying parents disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truth breakers False accusers, all these things are commandment breaking, eh? Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. When people see persons who are good, they despise that. They view you being good as softness and weakness. 
they glorify violence. They glorify a person who could instill fear in others. When they see you being good, they view that as weak. They despise those that are good. All these are the prevailing traits and experiences of men upon the earth in the last days. Brother Michael, did you check your WhatsApp? Did you check your WhatsApp? I sent you a message, right? So we are told that these are the traits that will prevail in the last days. And did you know that God used Paul here to warn us that there's going to be a movement that will seek to, in the name of doing something about this prevailing immorality, this deterioration of morality, they would seek to do something about it. But the way they're going to do, they're going to go about doing it. They're going to seek a conversion that is false. Verse five, right? Verse four and five. Verse five says, verse four says, sorry, traitors. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know what's up. Thank you, traitors, heady, high-minded, lo lovers of pleasure more than lo lovers of god look at verse five having what a form of godliness but what denying the power thereof from such turn away so when we speak about the prophecies to you and we tell you and we tell you listen the prophecies in the book of Revelation tell us that there is going to be a grand movement for the conversion of the world, but it's going to be a false conversion. Look, we are told about, about those things here. We are told that, listen, in the last days, there's going to be people who have a form of godliness. They think they are godly. They view themselves as people who worship God. They view themselves as Christians. And we are told that, listen, that is a form of godliness. Why? Because they deny the power of godliness. Now, when you go to Romans chapter 1, you would see what is the power of godliness that they deny. Right? Let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. So here we are seeing people with terrible personality traits. They are breaking the commandments of God, but yet still they have a form of godliness. You know what is that? That's a false justification because look, they deny the power of godliness. What is the power of godliness? Look at it here. Verse 16, it says, For I am not what? Ashamed of what? The gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. You, hear, you see the power of God in this, yeah? The power of God unto salvation. The word power there is dunamis. It means the, it means the science of how something works. So here we are being told the gospel is the science of God unto salvation. It is the science that God uses to save man. So the power of godliness is the gospel of Christ. The power of godliness is the gospel of Christ. And we are being told that, listen, there's going to be in the last days people who are in transgression of the commandments of God, terrible, horrible personality traits, lovers of their own self, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, but they have a form of godliness. They have a false gospel. 
So what does that tell you and I? That tells you and I that in the last days, we have to look for a movement where there would be people who are in transgression of the law. They claim to be serving God. They claim to have a gospel of Christ. But that gospel does not save them in that does not save them away from sin. They remain in their sins. So literally, what we are being told is that a false justification is going to exist in the last days, parading itself as the gospel of Christ. Leaving people in their sins while thinking they're serving God. That's a false justification. A false gospel. And since it is the gospel of Christ, then that gospel would be exalting what? Another Christ. So that is what we are told that would exist in the last days. Let's go in the prophecies to Revelation chapter 13. Right? Revelation chapter 13 tells us the same thing. If you look at Revelation 13, verse, verse 3 and 4, Revelation 13, 3 and 4, it says this. It says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. So this is pointing to a time when the entire world will wander after the beast. But what it means to wander after the beast? What really would the world be doing? Verse 4 tells us, And they worshipped the dragon. The dragon is the devil. Which gave power unto the beast. So the dragon is behind this beast. It says, and they worshipped the beast, saying, you see what it means to wander after the beast? It means to worship the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So we are told that in the last days, the entire world is going to worship the papal beast. And since the dragon is behind the beast, because he gave power unto the beast, then the entire world will be worshipping the dragon, which is the devil himself. Revelation 12 verse 9. That's what we are told. Look at verse 12 of Revelation 13. Verse 12 tells us exactly how. Like, where would this be taking place? Who will be doing it? Verse 12 says, and he, the he there is the beast in verse 11, which is the United States of America. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. So America is going to do the very same thing that the papal beast did, which is enforce its religion. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So America is going to lead out in the worship of this beast and therefore the worship of the dragon, the devil. This is going to happen on a global scale. But look, the issue is worship. The issue is what? Worship. And look who is ultimately being worshipped. Satan, the devil. And you know how he is seeking worship? Look at verse, let's look at verse 13 and let's go to Revelation 19. Look at the, look at the strategy that Satan will be using in the final days here to get worship. Verse 13 says of Revelation 13, And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven, on the earth, in the sight of men. Verse 14. And deceived them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. 
So somebody in America is going to work miracles, and the miracles will be used to deceive those that dwell on the earth to set up what is called an image to the beast. The reason for the image to the beast is because the beast is wounded. So something has to be set up because the beast cannot do anything on its own. It is wounded. So something has to be set up called the image to the beast. So the things that the beast did, this movement could do it too and cause the entire world to worship that be the first beast who is wounded. But what's the strategy? Look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. So Satan wants worship behind this papal beast, right? Look at the strategy he is using. Revelation 19 and verse 20 tells us, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. So we are told who exactly in America that does the miracles, that deceives people to set up the image of the beast, so that when the image of the beast is worshipped and the mark of the beast is, is accepted, is enforced and accepted, the beast gets worship, therefore Satan gets worship, we are told as a false prophet. The false prophet in America is who Satan would use to get worship. But Jesus tells us something about these false prophets. When you go to Matthew chapter 7, let's go and see what Jesus tell, tells us about these false prophets and you will see the strategy that Satan is using to get worship. Matthew chapter 7. We'll read verse 15. Look at what it says. Matthew 7 verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of what? False prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are what? Raven and wolves. So the false prophet, why do you think the, Jesus described the false prophet as coming in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what raven and wolves? It's because there's an outward adjustment in their behavior. There's an outward appearance of being innocent, of being lamb-like, of being Christ-like, of being like a sheep. But inwardly, raven and wolves, no change. Only to steal and kill and destroy they could do. This is the experience of the false prophet. So the one working miracles in Revelation 13. Jesus described them as, listen, these are people who are unconverted. Outwardly, they appear as sheep, but inwardly they are evening words. What is that? False justification. But to appear like a sheep outwardly, you have to do certain works. So what they are doing since they have no inward change is what? Righteousness by works. You see what, what Satan is using? False prophets who are unconverted, who have a false justification, who, have, who practices righteousness by works, but to make people think that they are following God, they work miracles. Mm. The miracles sustain the false justification. The miracles sustain the righteousness by works to make people think this <laughs> false justification is of God. That's why Jesus said from like verse 16 to 20, he said, listen, you will know them by their works. Just look at their works. Because a, a, a good tree can bring forth evil fruit and an evil tree can bring forth good fruit. You will know them by their works. From the moment you see their works are evil, they are false prophets. Right? But look at verse 21. Look at what the false prophet do. So it's not like, well, okay, it's a false prophet and a false prophet 
just um preaching about um or pro he's not proclaiming like someone of god or some kind of um strange new god that nobody knows or talking about himself or his own doctrine look at what he's professing verse 21 not everyone that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that dwell the will of my father which is in heaven so watch you for his prophet jesus is lord jesus is the christ so look at that a false justification righteousness by works but they're still they're calling jesus the christ and jesus saying many will say unto me he said not everyone that say unto me sorry lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven so they are appealing to jesus christ to accept their false conversion their false justification they are preaching that Christ is the Christ over their false gospel, their righteousness by works. But Christ identified them as those that don't do the will of my Father. He said, but he that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven only, he will enter the kingdom of heaven. And Psalms 48 shows the will of the Father is the law of the Father, the law in the heart. So when you see they proclaiming to follow Christ. They proclaiming conversion, but there is no keeping of the law of God. There is transgression of the law of God. Jesus show that's a false justification. Look at verse twenty two and verse twenty three. Jesus said, "Many will say to me, think about this, right? Many will say to me in that day." Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name do many wonderful works? You see what they're appealing to? They're telling Christ. Remember, they have a false conversion. Outward adjustment, no inward change, a breaking of the law of God. But they're still appealing to Christ and calling Christ Lord. And look at what they point to as a, as as evidence that what they are doing is of God, pointing to, pointing Christ to their their miracles. But look, we do miracles in Your name. We cast out demons in Your name. The fact that they are appealing to Christ is because Satan is still. In the end here, he will still be attempting to do what he did with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, mm. with the temptation. Still trying to get Christ to be the Christ over a false conversion. To be the Christ over righteousness by works. They are pointing to their works. What is that? Righteousness by works and asking Christ to accept that. But look at what Christ will do in Matthew 23. And then, sorry, in verse 23. Matthew 7, 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, you that work in equity. Christ don't know that. Christ is not the minister of sin. Christ is not the Christ over righteousness by works. Yes, the Christina, sister Sunshine says, the offering of Cain. How Cain offered his fruits and want God to accept that. They would be saying, Christ, but look, we cast out demons. Look how much wonderful works we do in your name. Excuse me, that is righteousness by works. And Christ is not the Christ over righteousness by works. Otherwise, he would be a false Christ. 
So since they do all this righteousness by works, but yet they are appealing to Christ as if they are his ministers because they say we do it in your name, then what Christ really they would be exalting? It is the devil, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 and 4 that we just read. The devil is the false Christ. And that is the strategy that he will be using in the end to cause men to think that in their righteousness by works, God will accept that. He is going to get the entire world except the saints to operate by presumption. And when they operate by presumption and sin and break the law of God, they want to still claim the promises of God. They want Christ to still be accepting of their sinful works that was not motivated by faith. And that is what we are to expect in the end. A form of godliness that is righteousness by works that doesn't deal with sin in the mind of man. And that's Satan's strategy. That is Satan's strategy to become the false Christ. To exalt himself as another Christ on earth. So, with that said, we want to go into this false conversion coming upon the world. Right? This false conversion that Satan will push upon the world. right one moment so right now one moment okay good yes so today is the last sunday of let me pull it up Today is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. That's the, the Catholic year where they have their different festival and feast for different saints and for quote and unquote Christ. This is the last Sunday of their liturgical year. And the last Sunday of the Catholic liturgical year is the Feast of Christ the King. So literally today, that has just passed, Sunday, is the Feast of Christ the King, according to the Catholic doctrine. So Catholics are celebrating the Feast of Christ the King. And we want to look into a little bit as to what does that mean? Because right now, evangelicals are also chanting that Jesus is king. Especially in light of the recent victory of Donald Trump with the elections. They are interpreting various things that Donald Trump is doing or what he proposes to do. They interpret that in light of the kingship of Christ. But when they say Christ is king, they are speaking about a social king. And we really we want to show you what the Catholic doctrine behind what a social kingship of Christ means. Because when we hear the term Christ is king, it sounds nice. But don't be quick to say amen, Christ is king. Yes, according to the scripture, but not the kind of king that the Catholic Church has him to be in the feast of Christ is king. So they are posting things like this on Twitter. They say it's the Feast of Christ the King. 12 hours ago this was posted. Um, they say earthly kingdoms and governments come and go, but our Lord re forever reigns as, Christ, as the King of the universe. And you know they're posting up things like this, right? Christ is King of the universe. And... 
Let me just pull up some more things. They are sharing things like these things here. Sharing things like this with the recent victory with Trump. When Trump was talking about bringing back Bible and religion. Look at this here. So, for example, the MAGA politicians. Right? This here is Majority Taylor Green. Recent, recently, she posted, holy, whatever. President Trump said religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. God bless Donald Trump. And she put the deep state doesn't like that. And she put Christ is king. And she posted a video of Donald Trump saying what he would do with the Bible and religion. Let me just play that for you now, right? So I'm just showing you. I showed you that as an example of a MAGA politician, how they interpret Donald Trump's victory. They interpret it in light of the kingship of Christ. They exalt the kingship of Christ. Look at this. This is what he said. So she posted this and she said, Christ is king. Regardless. Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. And I truly believe that we need to bring them back and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. All Americans need a Bible in their home. And I have many it's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. This Bible is a reminder that the biggest thing we have to bring back America and to make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important. It's so missing, but it's going to come back and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. In the end, we do not end. So you hear that, right? So he said that he will bring back Bible and religion in America. And look at how she interpreted that, interpreted that. She said Christ is king for that. And many evangelicals are echoing the same sentiment, right? Christ is king, Christ is king. So we want to play some of that for you. I just showed you just one or two tweets from Twitter. There is more. Let me just, let me see if I can show you at least two more. Right? But these are the kind of things that they are posting. Mm, one moment. Let me pull up this for you here. One moment. So, as I said just now, today is the Feast of Christ the King. And right now, Catholics are celebrating that feast. But look at how evangelicals, look at how even MAGA politicians ha are repeating the same concept about Christ and his king and they are interpreting the recent political climate in light of that. Look at this person. This person posted, this is how Catholic Poland glorifies Christ, Christ the king. Blessed Feast of Christ the King. And they posted this video, right? So let me show you that just a short video where they are celebrating the kingship of Christ right now, like today, like this weekend. Celebrating the kingship of Christ. Let me see. Look at this here.
Poland, um, Brother Omari. They are celebrating the Feast of Christ the King. And you would see, I would read for you. I would read for you what that means. We would go through and see what that means. Let me let me show you what Majority Taylor Green posted um, just today. Right? Look at this here. Bridget, listen. Look at what she posted today on Twitter. Well, this would be yesterday because it was 19 hours ago. Look at this. More than 50,000, sorry. More than 50,000 people gather in the name of Jesus Christ. This is very powerful. Christ is king. So this Christ is king. Fever is in the air. She says, without God, we would have nothing. God bless America. And then she posted a video. Look at how much people bedroom. Let me Let me play the video. So look at people gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. And she's chanting Christ is King, right? Look at look at the amount of people. Look at this here. Interpret this gathering here by apostate Protestants in light of Christ as King. So we want to just talk about this concept of the social kingship of Christ a little bit. Because you would be shocked. Why is it songs innocent like, yeah, America going back to Bible and religion. Yeah, America is going back to God. Yes, Jesus Christ is king, especially in light of defeating the communists, the leftists. Well, in the process of defeating them. They chant Christ is king. Christ is king. But what does that mean? What does that mean? We want to take a look at that. So let me just... Pull up for you this chart here now. Let's read a little bit on this social kingship of Christ. Watch this here. Look at this here. So this year is from... The encyclical of Pope Pius the 11th mm -hmm. on the Feast of Christ the King. The encyclical is Quas Primus. So this is an encyclical from a Pope, Pope Pius the 11th, and he is speaking out on the doctrine of the Feast of Christ the King, the doctrine behind that. So you see Catholics and Evangelicals chant, Christ is King, Christ is King, and they tweet everything they are interpreting in light of Christ being King. When they chant that, there's a doctrine behind it. Whether some of them know it or not, there's a doctrine behind the kingship of Christ. Here's the doctrine. Christ's kingship requires that the Catholic Church be state law, not tolerated as other religions, as part of religious liberty. No. 
as state law. So look at this here, point 31 in that encyclical. It says, when we pay honor to the princely dignity of Christ, men will doubtless be reminded that the church founded by Christ has a, sorry, wow. as a perfect society, that the church founded by Christ as a perfect society has a natural an inalienable right to perfect freedom and immunity from the power of the state. And that in fulfilling the task committed to her by God of teaching, <laughs> ruling, and guiding to eternal bliss, those who belong to the kingdom of Christ. She cannot be subject to any external power. So, in the doctrine of the Catholic Church, the teaching under the feast of Christ is king, they, do, they think that they are not subject to any power of the state. They do not, so they are not subjected, they do not subject themselves to any external power. Because in their minds, in their teaching, they have a task committed to them by God, and you will see it as we read on more and play other videos. That they have a task given to them by God to teach, to rule, and to guide people to eternal bliss. Does not sound familiar? Didn't somebody say that? Guiding people to eternal life, order people to eternal life. Didn't someone say that recently? Stephen Wolf. I got to say again, right? What just one? From the same encyclical on the Feast of Christ the King, it says, It was then put under the power of the state and tolerated more or less at the whim of princes and rulers. Some men went even further and wished to set up in the place of God's religion a natural religion consisting in some instinctive affection of the heart. There were even some nations who thought they could dispense with God and that their religion should consist in impiety and neglect of God. The rebellion of individuals and states against the authority of Christ has produced deplorable consequences. We lament these in the encyclical Ubi Akano, we lament them today. We firmly hope, however, that the feast of the kingship of Christ, which in future will be yearly observed, may hasten the return of society to our loving Savior. It would be the duty of Catholics to do all they can to bring about this happy result. So you hear the, the aim in this doctrine of the kingship of Christ? They want to return society to Christ. They want to bring back individuals and states on the, under the authority of Christ. They say, moreover, the annual and universal celebration of the Feast of the Kingship of Christ will draw attention to the evils which anti-clericalism has brought upon society in drawing men away from Christ and will also do much to remedy them. So the Feast of Christ the King, which they are celebrating now, is anti-clericalism. 
which is anti-teaching office of the Pope or anti-Roman Catholic Church authority within civil law or pro-religious liberty and separation of church and state. That is what, that is what anti-clericalism means. The Feast of Christ is King is against that. They view anti-clericalism as evil. So anti-clericalism is where they, they teach about religious liberty. It's religious liberty. It's separation of church and state or separation of religion and legislation. It is against the teaching office of the Pope, against the Roman Catholic Church having religious authority within civil law. Yet those things, it, they call it anti-clericalism. And look at how they view it. They say the annual and universal celebration of the Feast of the Kingship of Christ will draw attention to the evils which anti-clericalism has brought. So they think that this, these ideas of religious liberty, these ideas of separation of church and state or separation of religion and legislation, these ideas that the church Catholic Church shouldn't have that influence in the states, that in religious influence within civil law or authority within civil law. Any doctrines that says that the Roman Catholic Church shouldn't have that authority within civil law, that has brought evils upon the world, upon society. And they are hoping that this feast of the kingship of Christ will draw people's attention to the evils that those principles have brought and somehow return people to christ and obviously returning people to christ would be returning people to the christ of the catholic church right which is really dear religion enforced by law enforced by the states so you're getting the idea of this feast of christ is king right these are the, the doctrines behind it. These are the principles behind it. Look at this quote here. So it's not as simple. When you, when you hear them chant, Christ is king, and you think in your mind, well, yeah, Christ is king. Yes, the Bible says Christ is king, but what do they mean? What's in their doctrines? Look at this here from the same encyclical from Pope Pius XI on the Feast of Christ the King. Here's what he said. If we ordained the whole Catholic world, sorry, if we ordain that the whole Catholic world shall revere Christ as King, we shall minister to the need of the present day. And at the same time, provide an excellent remedy for the plague which now infects society and yet we refer to the plague of anti-clericalism it just means anti the cleric right so any principle that is against the teaching office of the pope they call that anti-clericalism hmm. any principle that is for religious liberty they call that anti-clericalism any principle that says separation of religion and legislation, they say anti-clericalism. Hear, and you hear what they call it? They call it a plague. We refer to the plague of anti-clericalism, its errors and impious activities. This evil spirit, as you are well aware, venerable brethren, has not come into being in one day. It has long looked behind the surface. The empire of Christ over all nations, you hearing this? The empire of Christ. So when they say Christ is king, this is what they mean. The empire of Christ over all nations was rejected. The right which the church has from Christ himself. Okay, I'll see Brother Medina's comment. I'll read it after the quote, right? The right which the church has from Christ himself to teach mankind, to make laws, to govern people 
in all that pertains to their eternal salvation, that right was denied. Are you hearing this? Then gradually the religion of Christ came to be likened to false religions and to be placed ignominiously on the same level with them. You hear what they're saying? You see, are you hearing the teaching behind that phrase, Christ is King? This is the teaching of the social kingship of Christ. This feast of Christ is King that the Catholic Church is celebrating right now around the world. This is the teaching behind it. Behind it is that Christ is setting up his empire here on the earth. His kingdom here on the earth. And Christ gave the church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, with the Pope at the head. Christ gave the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic people, see the right to teach mankind, the teaching office of the Pope, to make laws, to govern peoples in all that pertains to the eternal salvation. And they say with anti-clericalism now, where they, this, this teaching of religious liberty and separation of church and state and no, and the church not having authority within civil law, they, these principles here deny that right that the church have. That right that the church have to teach people and govern mankind and make laws govern people in terms of their eternal salvation using the laws of the state, that right was denied by these principles of religious liberty and so on here. That's the teaching behind Christ as King. It's deadly. So when they talk about Christ as King, Christ as King, yeah, Donald Trump is bringing back religion and religion and bible in america and they say yes christ is king you know what is behind that similar teachings to the doctrine behind the feast of christ the king festival now i just quoted some of these for you for time's sake but there's more let me let me let me at least quote for you one more right one more and I'll read Madam Dina's comment. One more. Watch this. One more. Watch this here. Watch this. In the same encyclical, look at what we would see. That Christ has authority in civil law. Rulers of nations must revere and obey Christ. Here's what it says, Pope Pius XI on the Feast of Christ the King. It would be a grave error, on the other hand, to say that Christ has no authority whatever in civil affairs. Since by virtue of the absolute empire over all creatures committed to him by the Father, all things are in his power. Are you hearing that? So they are saying that, obviously, through the church, through the office of the Pope, Christ has his authority in civil law. That, what is that? That is religious authority within civil law. That's the same authority that the Catholic Church had for 1,260 years in the Dark Ages. Watch, watch the next point. Thus the empire of our Redeemer embraces all men. To use the words of our immortal predecessor, Pope Leo the 13th. Right. His empire includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons, who, though of right belonging to the church, have been led astray by error or have been cut off by, by her schism, but all those who are outside the Christian faith. Hmm. You hearing that? 
so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. So when we play for you videos, as a matter of fact, I'll play, we'll, play, we'll be looking at one of those videos. When you see people like Nick Fuentes talking about um, America is a Christian nation and we're going to make America a Christian nation and Christianity is right and everything else is wrong and why we should why should we leave other people to be wrong and if you don't want to follow that then you could move to another place and even though you go to another place we will follow you there because why should we leave everybody else to perish we would follow you there and you'll have to become Christian but when he says things like that this where do you think it comes from it is the doctrine that is taught in the feast of Christ the king that Christ, through the church, through the Roman Catholic Church, should have authority within civil law. Look at the last paragraph now. It says, nor is there any difference in this matter between the individual and the family or the state. For all men, all men, listen, whether collectively on a whole, as a nation, as a community, as a nation, as a world, for all men, whether collectively or individually, are under the dominion of Christ. In him is the salvation of the individual. In him is the salvation of society. He is the author of happiness and true prosperity for every man and for every nation. If, therefore, the rulers of nations wish to preserve their authority to promote and increase the prosperity of their countries, they will not neglect the public duty of reverence and obedience to the rule of Christ. You hear any doctrine, Regent? Yeah. Are you hearing any doctrine behind the social kingship of Christ? Are you hearing any doctrine behind when you hear a Catholic or evangelical or any on one of those apostate protestants, they chant Christ is king. Christ is king. This is the doctrine behind it. That Christ through the church must rule in civil affairs. And they must use the state to establish that rule. So that men would be under the dominion of Christ, whether as individuals or whether collectively, as a whole. Are you paying attention? Are you getting that? So watch this here. Let me read from Brandina's comment, right? Brandina is saying here, the world is being miseducated for the rise and acceptance of the image of the beast and the healing of the beast, we see the end coming. So all these, all the, the changes in the political climate and the plans that Donald Trump is seeking to do. And you know, all the different things that is being done to fight against the communists, to fight against the left. All those things is being interpreted as Christ is king. Christ is king. All that is being interpreted as we need conversion of people, of men, of individuals, and of society as a collective. Christ is king. The Catholic Church is still up to today celebrating the feast of Christ the King. And these are the teachings behind it. So when the world is, is looking on and saying, yeah, they, when they interpret all these, these fight against the left as the victory of Christ against the left, that's a miseducation. And they are, they will become accepting of the image of the beast. Because the image of the beast would be set up. One of the reasons is to fight against the immorality caused by the left. And all the evils caused by the left. 
And the entire world will be led to think that Christ is behind that. Right? Grace and peace to you, Paul Baron III. I see another comment here from Brother Medina. He says, but atheistic anti-clericalism as in the French Revolution is seen in the sixth plague. Sixth plague. And in Revelation 17, we'll see 11 to 16. Revelation 17, in the sixth plague. The drying up of the river of Euphrates. And the unclean spirit like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast. The atheistic anti-clericalism, like in the French Revolution. Oh, the atheistic anti-clericalism. So the... But um, Dina, when you say the atheistic anti-clericalism, you're speaking about the communist idea of separation of church and state, right? So you are saying that that is seen in the sixth plague? I'm thinking, I'm looking at it. There's the river of Euphrates drying up in verse 12. And then there is the unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And there is the spirits of devils working miracles to go forth unto the kings of the earth to gather them together to the battle. So verse 12, the drying up of the river Euphrates. That's the sixth Because verse 13 and 14 is an interjection of what establishes the beast and the image of the beast of the so the sixth plague is the, fever, the river of Euphrates. Oh, right. Slow boy. But um, so the sixth plague is Babylon losing her support, losing her supporters. Hmm. So that is when after the dense darkness, when they rush with the dead decree, the dense darkness happens, they realize they are lost. They turn on the spiritual leaders of Babylon and blame them for them being lost. And that is atheistic anti-clericalism. Oh, I see it. <laughs> yes, Brother Kobe, go ahead. I see it. I no, see you it. said it. You said it, dear. Amen, amen. Oh, good. <laughs> My God. And Revelation 17. So, right, so, right, Revelation 17, verse 11 the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goes into perdition. So it self destructs, right? I see that too. Hmm. Hmm. And verse 16. And it's right, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, they shall hate the whole and make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Wow. I see it. So in under the sixth plague, when people realize that they, they are lost because they have been following Babylon and her daughters with the sun, they learn the image of the beast and everything. And when they realize that they are lost under the sixth plague, they will turn on Babylon and they will and there will be violence and bloodshed. Mm -hmm. And that would be the atheistic anti-clericalism like in the French Revolution. Okay. The last 15 days of the issue in one hour. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes. Okay. That was nice. Right. So, hmm. that was nice to see the six plague and that that river of Euphrates drying up there to see it in light of an atheistic anti-clericalism. Yeah, because that is what it is. Right? So, you all see what is behind the feast of Christ's King, right? 
So atheistic anti-clericalism under the sixth plague, that's what would be happening against these teachings here. Against those teachings behind Christ's king, the social kingship of Christ. Right. So they teach that the Catholic, so, so it, Catholic shows, it shows the future mm -hmm. of false Christianity. Mm -hmm. Destruction. Amen. <laughs> so with all that in mind now, look at this video in light of what we just learned behind this concept of the feast of Christ the King, the social kingship of Christ. The people that think just like I do. They feel just like I do. They want to see God back in America just like I do. Now, we may not all agree on every doctrinal issue. We may not all be Christians in here. But the reality is, we know why we are here tonight. But we never come to you and ask, this is real apostolic ministry. We're not, this is real apostolic ministry. This is real apostolic ministry. Jesus said, if any two of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done. So I want to tell you why that number, if any two of you, there are two streams in America that have been separated. The conservatives and the revivalists. There are two streams in America that have been separated. The conservatives and the revivalists. So what you're seeing is the apostate Protestants, the daughters, having the same concept. The same concept behind that teaching about the social kingship of Christ. That church and state have to unite, meaning the church or the, the religion should be established by the state because the church should, should influence, have influence within civil law. These are the daughters. And look, they have the very same concept as the mother. We just read the concept of the mother behind this teaching of Christ being king. You know, and what I forgot to say as well, before I read Brother Medina's comment, um, the fact, Brother Medina, that the Catholic Church today is still celebrating this Feast of Christ the King. Today, is the, today Sunday, is the last Sunday of, the, of their liturgical year. It's the Feast of Christ the King. The fact that they are, that they are celebrating that and this, the, the doctrine behind the Feast of Christ the King, of Christ the King, teaches that the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic papacy with its teaching office must have religious authority within civil law. It, it exposes the ignorance and the compromise of Ganon Diop's ecumenism. When he said just recently that the Catholic Church has changed the fact that they are still celebrating the feast of Christ the King, it shows that they have not changed. Is they, they have not changed. They hold the same doctrines. It's just that they are wounded. And the daughters, now that we are looking at here, they would be the ones to do the work. Because look, the same principles here. I see, Sister Anissa, is that you? Under the church page saying, hmm, yes, it was atheistic, anti-clericalism that wounded the papal beast in 1798 after all, rejecting the seventh head's teaching office and religious authority within civil law. It's the seventh head whose wound is about to be healed. Amen. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Yes. Hello, Sister Anissa. 
So let's look at some of the daughters, right? Okay, I see a, a comment from Brother Nina here before I go on with the video. He said here, this is the future of anti-clericalism now. This is the future of anti-clericalism now present. Oh, right. Let me start over. This is the future of anti-clericalism now present. We see the rise of the image of the beast and the healing of the beast. But we also see the rise of anti-clericalism at the same time. We know the end is near as seen in these anti movements. Things are happening behind the scenes. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. I see Brother Maiden tagging me here. Thank you, Brother Maiden. I read that comment. Um, I read that comment higher up. Right? I read that comment before, just a minute ago. So let's look on at the daughters. So that that they have the same principle behind this. One has been in the political camp. The other has been working in the church. The devil has told you those in the church, don't make any political comments. The devil has told those in the conservative movement, stay out of the churches. But those two forces, when they come together, I'm gonna try it again. Those two forces, when they come together, and all things are possible. Wow. Now we have let the serpent in this garden called America. The good news is we have authority to get rid of the serpent in our garden, and we are doing that now. Amen. It's a two it's a two-pronged approach. We must do we must marry these two uh, arenas, the yes. civil and the sacred. They are not sure. separate in scripture. Nope. The, we must marry these two uh, arenas, the yes. civil and the sacred. They are not sure. separate in scripture. You hear that? It's the same doctrine of the Catholic Church in the Feast of Christ the King. So when you hear them chanting Christ is King, when you see them celebrating the, the triumph of Donald Trump and the bringing back of Bible and religion and the defeating of the left, whilst we do we agree with the with certain policies and certain principles, but they are righteousness by works. But look at how the evangelicals interpret these things. They interpret it as their religion, the church, should rule in the state. Church and state should come together, religion and legislation. These are the principles behind that feast of Christ the King. So look, the Catholic Church, we saw it from the Catholic Church, and look, look we are hearing it from the daughters. Nope. The prophets, the men of God, the priests, work with the governors and the kings. God never intended for it to be separate. We must go after this nation through righteous leaders and government laws, but we must also do it with the authority he has given us in the spirit to deal with the serpent and say, they're going to represent us in Washington, but we're going into our closet and we're going to run you out of our garden. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead. All right, Dutch, lead us. So we'll read it together, okay? As a patriot of faith, 
I attest my allegiance first and foremost to the kingdom of God and the Great Commission. Secondly, I agree to be a watchman over our nation concerning its people and their rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whereas we, the church, are God's governing body on the earth, whereas we have been given legal power from heaven and now exercise our authority, whereas we are God's ambassadors and spokespeople over the earth, whereas through the power of God we are the world influencers, whereas because of our covenant with God we are equipped and delegated by Him to destroy every attempted advance of the enemy. We make our declarations. We decree that America's executive branch of government will honor God and defend the Constitution. We decree that our legislative branch, Congress, will write only laws that are righteous and constitutional. We decree that our judicial system will issue rulings that are biblical and constitutional. We will never stop fighting. We will never, ever, ever give up or give in. We will take our country back. We will honor the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. America shall be saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be at the center of American politics. What does that look like exactly? And they were saying all these things even before Trump was elected. Exactly. Explain, explain what, how you see that playing out in American society. What well, laws that are a contrary to God's word that are actively, actively laws today. Let me say that again. Laws that are contrary to God's word that are actively legal or laws today need to be overturned. And so any law that is against the word of God that is clearly against what God has said in his word in a nation that is a Christian nation, a nation that has the majority of citizens who actively believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is coming back again with omnipotent power in his hands, that if it's against the word of God and it's actively a law today, then it should be overturned because we should have a, a more compass. And right now in America, we're losing that more compass. The liberal left well, is slowly slipping away. She said, I won't remain silent. So, Brother Dina says here, traditional Catholicism is striking back. There's a growing movement within Catholicism for the removal of the communist Pope Francis and the re-establishment of traditional Catholicism. This is the Catholicism that resonates with the apostate Protestants. Christ is king political concepts. So this is the Catholicism that resonates with the apostate Protestants. Christ is king political concepts. If, oh, yes, amen. So Pope Francis has to go. There's need for a Pope there that will reestablish traditional Catholicism, that agrees with traditional Catholicism, because it is traditional Catholicism with these kind of concepts regarding Christ's kingship that will resonate with the apostate Protestants' idea about... Um, crisis kingship and their political concepts, right? In fact, I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. Amen. The church is supposed to direct 
the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Hmm. So you hear the daughters? The same concept. The church is supposed to direct the government. That's the same concept of the in the doctrine of the feast of Christ the King. And look, she call look what she called the, the separation of church and state principle, which is really supposed to be proper word, the best word in the separation of religion and legislation. She called that a, it wasn't it wasn't a stinking letter. Look at what she called that a stinking letter. When those are important principles. So look. You know, this this reminds me of the video that we looked at on last Thursday, where this idea of crisis social kingship it is really it it does not go hand in hand with the U.S. Constitution. It doesn't go hand in hand with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This this Christ is King when that is put in into action. The political concept of Christ behind Christ is king. It's against the First Amendment because it is against religious liberty. And this is exactly where the daughters are headed. They have the same principles. your children the most important thing that they can possibly learn to say today right now and for the rest of their lives viva Cristo Rey long live Christ the King myself something like a Christian futurist instead because Jesus Christ was our past before any of us were born or conceived Jesus Christ is our present now and Jesus Christ is our future after we die on earth we want this century to be the most Christian century in the history of planet Earth. In the My name is Marjorie Taylor Green. I am the daughter of the King, the one true living God, the Alpha, the Omega, our Father in Heaven, and I am a forgiven sinner, washed in the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. Christ is King. Praise God. Amen. Christ is King. The other thing that 
that's got to go from the public life at the highest levels is this Talmudic Judaism. <laughs> these things sometimes you sit and you wonder if Bridget really seen how late and how serious the times are you look at the evangelicals and they have it's like everybody they're on fire they're zealous they're waking up everything they're doing there is a is a false conversion is a false righteousness is a just a slight adjustment in their behavior is not true conversion because why christ is king but where is his law their christ is king is a social king that must set up a kingdom here on the earth and sometimes you wonder if we're really seeing what we are up against are you saying that we are up against the entire world being converted to this so this so-called christ this christ of our sunday law are you saying that we will no longer have the principles of republicanism on our side We would, we, would, would, we would no longer have the principles of republicanism enshrined in something called a constitution on our side. Are you seeing that? And our fight would not be, well, the constitution says this and the constitution says that, and what you're doing is illegal. No, our fight, our fight would be Jesus is king. And he's Yahweh of the Sabbath. They have to keep the seventh day. The only constitution we would we would be left to point to is the constitution in heaven, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. That is our charter of rights. But you see the daughters having the same concept when they chant Christ is king. It's the same concept of the mother. That the church must rule in the state. And that's exactly where we are heading. Everything is rounding up. Right? So, let me show you 
because we want to just touch some we want to touch some scriptures right but before we touch there there was a video we played last week and i just want to play a piece of it to show you this idea of the social kingship of christ that both the mother and the daughter agree with it is against the constitution we saw that in a video that uh, that we, re we reviewed last Thursday, and I just want to play a portion of it again. The social kingship of Christ is against the principles of republicanism, it's against the principles of religious liberty, it's against your rights and your freedoms. This is a Christ. That is anti-rights and freedom. This is a Christ that is against religious liberty. The doctrine of the social kingship of Christ exalts Satan as the false Christ. And the fact that the daughters carry the very same concept when they set up their image of the beast and when they enforce the mark of the beast is the very same false Christ. So watch this here. This is Boniface from the blog and website Unam Sanctam Catholicam. Today is November 25th, 2012, the Feast of Christ the King. And the title of this reflection is The Social Kingship of Christ in the United States. Uh, and I thought that today on this Feast of Christ the King, it would be good to reflect on what the social kingship of Christ means to a Catholic in modern America. I think to a large degree I'll probably be preaching to the choir here, but I, I did want to give an explanation, especially to many of our conservative friends of whatever religious affiliation, who are mystified that we don't jump on the back to the Constitution bandwagon. All authority ultimately comes from God. This is taught plainly in the scriptures and, and Christian tradition. This goes back to Christ's interview with Pontius Pilate when he tells Pilate that, uh, that Pilate would have no authority over him if it had not been given from above. And in Romans 13, St. Paul says, quote, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. That's Romans 13, verses 1 and, uh, <clears throat> and 2. So all authority ultimately comes from God. There's not a civic authority that's, that's independent of the authority of God. All human authority is bound up and dependent upon God's authority and established by God. Now the Feast of Christ the King calls to mind the social kingship of Christ. And that is the concept that Christ's reign is not just established over individuals, over uh, particular souls, but whole societies, cultures, and nations as well. And, and that's just that's just logical, you know, logical coherence. So you hear that, right? The feast of Christ is king is about the social kingship of Christ. It's not just about Christ ruling over you, like the individual. But Christ ruling over whole societies and people. You're paying attention, right? How could Christ have uh, primacy over a hundred individuals, you know, singly but not collectively? In 1925, when the Feast of Christ the King was instituted, Pope Pius XI wrote in the encyclical Quas Primas in uh, section 18, quote, The empire of our Redeemer embraces all men. To use the words of our immortal predecessor, Pope Leo XIII, his empire includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons, who, though of right belonging to the church, have been led astray by error or cut off from her by schism, but also all of those who are outside the Christian faith so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. Nor is there any difference in this matter between the individual and the family 
or the state. For all men, whether collectively or individually, are under the dominion of Christ. In him is the salvation of the individual, in him is the salvation of society. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. End quote. So, it's not just the individual that has an obligation in justice to seek and render worship unto God, but society and government as well. Societies and governments are obliged to give public honor to Christ and let the gospel influence law and administration of the government. And this again going back to the, the notion that all authority ultimately comes from God, and because this authority comes from God as its source, human authorities um, render what is due to God by giving glory and honor to Christ, the King of Kings and the source of all authority. Now this uh, Catholic teaching is quite different from the principles upon which our own nation was founded. Our nation was founded on the principles of the deistic enlightenment, especially the, the teachings of John Locke and to a lesser degree Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who put forward a different concept of where the authority of government comes from. Locke and Rousseau were uh, proponents of what's known as the social contract theory or the social compact, and ultimately this comes down to us in the phrase that governments derive their authority from the consent of the governed, a phrase that finds its way into our Declaration of Independence. Notice that there's no reference to God. The authority doesn't descend from above, but it, it sort of arises from the consent of the governed. N never mind that how many of the governed need to give their consent is, is not addressed, or what constitutes consent. consent. Does it need to be explicit, implicit? You know, what is consent exactly? But the basic idea is that, um, that government gets its authority from the consent of people who are willing to be governed by it. Now, if it's from the consent of man, then it is purely a human, man-focused institution with no place for God in the government. Now, the founders of our country knew this, and thus omitted any mention of God from the Constitution. Now, the dating of the Constitution in the year of our Lord uh, is just a, a pro forma um, pro forma statement of how people dated things back then. The, the fact that it says in the year of our Lord doesn't make the Constitution Christian any more than the nation of India dating its official documents 2012 means India is a Christian nation because they're using the Anno Domini dating system. Um, there is no mention of God in the Constitution. It's conspicuously absent. The United States was set up as a purposefully secular state, the first such in, in the history of the world. So the conservative fable of the Christian founding of our nation is really a myth, and this is why, in my opinion, Catholics, especially traditional Catholics, can't jump on the, the back to the Constitution bandwagon. The Constitution itself is a secular document in which God and the social kingship of Christ are intentionally omitted and replaced with uh, the principles of John Locke. Uh, a so you hear that, right? So those things that he said there, some of the things that he said there is a lie. Because as Brother Romari said, republicanism came from God. Its principles came from God, religious liberty, liberty of conscience. It came from God. Our rights and are endowed, as Brother Beach put here, we, we showed these things last week, endowed by the Creator, it's in the Declaration of Independence, the guiding principles of the Constitution. But his reason like that, why? Because the social kingship of Christ is absent in a Republican form of Constitution. And that's what he said lastly there. We're trying to paint it as if, you know, the Constitution doesn't mention God at all and America is a totally secular state and it's not as conservative as, as some claim it to be. And 
trying to show that listen the founding fathers totally left out god and christ everything out of the constitution no that's a lie but he made up that showman to introduce the idea that the current constitution of the united states of america does not support the principles of the social kingship of christ <laughs> but Marina says please explain these things do not let him get away So you hear that, right? That's the, that's the part that I wanted to bring it to. So clearly what we are seeing is that God allowed republicanism. God orchestrated the founding of the, Ameri the nation of America with its Repub this, its Jeffersonian republicanism form of government, with its re with its republicanism principles enshrined in the Constitution, acknowledging that our rights came from the Creator, and those rights were it is inalienable coming from Him, and it is inviolable. It shouldn't be violated by any. Those are christian principles that caused america to be a christian nation the lamb like horns in revelation 13 and verse 12 protestantism and republicanism those are the principles that founded the nation of america the cornerstone of the republic is liberty of conscience god orchestrated that but the guy in the video here is seeking to paint the picture that America is totally secular and there is no it there's no Christian principle or there is no God whatsoever in the constitution or any the principles. There's no God behind any principles in the constitution at all. So America is godless. That's the picture he's seeking to give. America is totally godless as a secular state. Godless secularism. So he paints that, that lie to say because he wants to bring in the idea we need the social kingship. As if the absence of the doctrine of the social kingship or the principles of the social kingship of christ the absence of that from the republican constitution is the absence of christ from the constitution but have you seen that oh my god he is painting the idea that the absence of the principles of the social kingship of christ from republicanism is the absence of christ from republicanism you see that the man is literally setting up a false Christ. When Christ is responsible for republicanism. Mm -hmm. But when we saw, when we read Quas Primus from Pope Pius XI, he, he, the guy even read a piece of it in, in the video here. And we saw the doctrine behind the social kingship of Christ. That through the teaching office of the Pope, the Roman Catholic papacy must have religious authority within civil law. Making laws, governing men, governing in, not only individuals, but society as a collective, as a whole. True laws from the state. When we saw th those are the principles behind it. Republicanism was set up to do away with that republicanism was set up by god to fight against the social kingship of christ doctrine and the 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 product of it from the catholic church so literally republicanism was set up to fight against the false christ you see that <laughs> You see that, Brother Menina? Republicanism was set up by Christ, the lamb-like horns, 
to fight against the false Christ, the social kingship of Christ, the mm -hmm. false Christ that is exalted through the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ. So, when the guys, guy, this guy's been given the idea that, listen, this American constitution here, it doesn't have the social kingship of Christ in it. No God in the constitution, no so social kingship of Christ. Excuse me, it was set up to do away with that. And he's given the idea, no social kingship of Christ in the constitution, no God in the constitution, godless. No. There's a false Christ. Yes, Brother Michael. Also, just to add, right, we have to understand what it was Christians who was fleeing the people control, temporal control, or temporal power, which is the social kingship of Jesus from Europe that landed in America. So it is Protestant Christian that was fleeing from the reign of the papacy within civil law and landed on the shores of America and was used by providence, was used by the providential kingship of Jesus to set up a secular government that will not exercise the power that was exercised in Europe when the papacy came control in civil law. That will not violate the powers that belong only unto God, that only God must exercise. And that recognizes that man was created by a creator with certain inalienable rights and freedoms. So when they set up the government, it wasn't deist, deistic people set it up. No. It was Protestants who flee from the social kingship of the papacy over Europe. It was Christians who flee there. So the historical connection of America begins with people who oppose the social kingship, who was Amen. against the social kingship, and who wanted a government that would not be religious, that will not be, that will not take religion into its bosom and persecute them, like what happened. So they set up a secular government under God that respects the rights and freedoms of all and will allow the free society for the practice of religion of all. That's what it did. <laughs> and, the, and what we see in America also with the history we know the concept of the papacy started creeping to cause, to destroy that. So God had us to send Rod to correct that with the concept of liberty of conscience and that God. So look at the history. You have people fleeing from the social kingship, reaching America, take up the same policy of the social kingship in America, but send another man who is a Protestant, who is a Christian, that flee from there too. That come with the concept of liberty of conscience. And oppose what was taking place there for the nation to be set up free from the social kingship yes. of the papacy as a Amen. secular government. Amen. So they don't need to put they don't need to put God in the constitution for it to be of God. They don't need to say, okay, God in the constitution and it is not of God. The fact that God is unnamed in the constitution doesn't do it do away with the providential kingship of god behind the setting up of the constitution mm -hmm. because just the separation of power show what was responsible amen and it's in it is in the declaration of independence by reality recognized as the creator from whom our rights come from so the rights in the constitution itself is the rights that come from the creator mentioned in the declaration of independence so is is a is a blatant lie it's a blatant lie paying the founding fathers as 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 creating some kind of godless state with godless principles 
and that is not true is a blatant lie all because he wants to bring in the idea that we must have the social kingship of christ because look at what this look at what this kind of constitution did look at the state look at what the left come and do excuse me the left put a spin on their interpretation of, of certain principles in republicanism. But what the papacy did is the same thing that the leftists do, but they do it in the name of religion. They attack rights and freedoms in the name of religion. So let me just read some comments here, right? So Yes, that's what you're not in, right? Mm -hmm. But why you act that way? is because the United States Constitution does not recognize the reign of the church within civil law over the consciences of people, over the conscience of people. And because the government does not recognize the social kingship of Jesus, the reason in this heart, because they don't recognize the social kingship of Jesus and the authority of the church, they are atheistical. Mm -hmm. Where, where, how, how, how? Not so because our government. You have to acknowledge right. the authority of the Catholic Church. Otherwise, you're godless and atheistical. That is exactly the point. Hmm. So, apart from the so only the Catholic Church have a Christ to exalt. That is the Christ you have to exalt. Otherwise, you're godless. You see, so, so you, do you see how Satan exalts himself as Christ? Brother Omari said, the social kingship of Christ cannot exist in a republican form of government. Amen. Republicanism was set up, set up to do away with the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ and its fruits. He said, only Satan speaks against republicanism and protestantism. So, so when, you see, when now you hear Catholics speaking like this, talking about the social kingship of Christ, and if you don't have that in the constitution, you're godless. And when you see they promote, they're still celebrating the feast of Christ the King. They're chanting Christ the King. When you see the daughters chanting Christ the King and calling for the very same social kingship of Christ, because the social kingship of Christ means the church should rule in the government. When you see the apostate protestant calling for the very same thing, it means that America will soon speak as a dragon because it is a dragon that speaks against republicanism and protestantism. It is a dragon who is responsible for the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ. But as Samson said, republicanism is against Catholic principles and their false Christ. Brother Bish said, America under republicanism has existed and has been a beacon of success for over 200 years. Contrast this with the destruction of nations under Catholicism. But as Samson said, republicanism condemns popery and its dogmas. It shows that God gives inalienable rights to man and no man have power or authority to violate them. Amen. Hmm. But as Samson also said, social kingship is against, against Christ as providential king and subjective king in a secular society. Amen. Sister Anissa is saying here, as long as there is religious liberty, the social kingship of Christ cannot be established. Amen. And this is why they hate Jeffersonian Republican Constitution of the USA because Course Primer says that religious liberty leads to indifferentism, which is the idea that it makes people see the Catholic Church as just another religion among other religions and have freedom to follow according to the dictates of conscience. They hear this. Um, let me see. Let me see the end of this. They hear this because they want their religion alone to be enforced in civil law, which goes against the grain of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Amen. Sister Anissa again says here, a government that will not enforce religion by law with penalty, nor prohibit free exercise of religion by law with penalty. This is all secular means. It does not mean godless. 
Amen. Beautiful. Brother Medina here says, he seeks to present the Constitution as a godless document so that the Catholics can deal with it not being restrained by a divine authority behind the Constitution. Hmm. Secular does not mean hostile to God or religion. We know it was not hostile to religion because it protects liberty of conscience and the holding of office from communism and communism. The constitution was made taking the rights of God into consideration. It's like the book of Esther. Amen. You see that? Beautiful. So that's what the guy did when he says, oh, there's no God in the constitution and the social kingship of Christ is not there. There's no God there. As if no social kingship, according to the Catholic Church, godless. Because the word God is not mentioned, godless. Totally secular, not conservative. It's a, it's a lie. He presented as godless. But I love this point here. Because when he presented as godless now, then they would be fighting against something that they pay, they, they, they say is godless. So if it's godless, then, then God is not responsible for those principles there. So therefore, they could fight against it. Wow, what a way to fight conviction. And therefore, those who seek to point out the rights and freedoms guaranteed and protected in the Constitution, that protests, they will identify that as godless. Yes. You see why they would accuse us as, as being on the side of the left? <laughs> so look at that. Identified as godless, so therefore they would not be restrained to fight against it because they don't see it as being of a divine origin. They don't see a divine authority behind it. So he says secular does not mean hostile to God or religion. So secular doesn't necessarily mean atheistical. It just means no religion is established by law, protected by law, prohibited by law. Men are left with liberty of conscience. And the fact that the principle of liberty of conscience is protected, it shows there is divine authority behind it. But look at how Satan set up his doctrine of the social kingship of Christ, himself as a false Christ, against the doctrine of liberty of conscience that God that God set up in republicanism there, that God protects in, in republicanism. You see what Satan did there? Right? So this was um this was a beautiful comment by God's grace. Let me see. So Anissa says, yes, this is why Pope Francis is seen in, uh, sorry, this is why Pope Francis is seen as in apostasy by traditional and conservative Catholics because he literally called for religious liberty and says all religions are different parts to God, contrary to Pope Pius XI, social kingship of Christ. So you see, that's a very important comment there because Though we have shown Pope Francis saying these things over and over, people don't see the, the, the depths of understanding what that would mean for the Catholic Church. Because the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ is against religious liberty. Religious liberty is the most pestilential error according to their doctrines. It's a heresy. As a matter of fact, in this video here, which we're not going to play out for time's sake, because I really want to close off with two quotes from uh, Mrs. White regarding the daughters who would follow in these steps. And some scriptures. Um, but the fact that Pope Francis spoke in favor of religious liberty that is against the social, the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ. 
So the very feast that they are celebrating today, or they were celebrating this weekend here, the feast of Christ the King, Pope Francis, in his very position regarding religious liberty, is against that, and therefore against traditional Catholicism. Right? So you cannot have a Pope like that seek it, um, that will agree with the apostate protestant idea of Christ as king in politics. He won't. Right? Nice. Cesaria here said, so hostility to religion is actually hostility to conscience. So both the leftist persecution of religion and the enforcing an idea of religion upon men's conscience both are hostile to god communism and communism are both satan's weapon against the true christ amen brother michael said so to deal with the constitution of the united states it is by horrible deception that caused the casting off of conviction in a way to destroy conscience you see that you see that and the daughters would follow in the same path. The same path. Let me let me show you this quote here. Where is it? One moment. Let me show you this quote here. Mrs. White said this about the daughters, what the daughters would do. She showed the daughters would follow in the very same path as the mother. So, in however they they narrate themselves, they will do the same thing. They will paint the constitution as somehow supporting of the left, and they will have to change it. Obviously, the Bible tells the Bible tells us the main thing that would that would be um, used to change it is the miracles. Number one. But whatever narrative that they, told, they would be saying, it would be similar to what their mother said before. It's godless. We saw an example with Lauren Bo Bert there, however you pronounce her last name. She said it's a, the separation of church and state stuff. It's in a stinking letter and it's not what they say it is. So they know that the leftists use a, a, a perverted idea of separation of church and state. And they could use that argument and say, listen, you see this level. Get rid of this first amendment. Change it. Brother Michael saying something they watch. <laughs> so let me share my screen here, right? Watch this. What would Mrs. White said the daughters would do? Last day events. It's very tiny. Turn it up. Let me see if I zoom it. Last day events. Page 261. Romanism in the old world. An apostate protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course towards those who honor all the divine precepts. You see that? All who honor the divine precepts, what are, they, what are they living up to? What are they valuing? What are they exercising? Their freedom of religion, their religious liberty, liberty of conscience. But... Romanism went, went against liberty of conscience with their, with their social kingship of Christ doctrine, establishing their religion by law. And protest, apostate Protestantism in the new world will do the very same thing against liberty of conscience. That is what we are told will happen. Right? The son is asking me to read... Let me see what you're asking me to read here. Okay, one moment. Just so Anissa is saying here, I have to get the entire thing on my phone. The, the whole thing is not showing on the screen, right? She said, Sister, can you please read this? It clearly shows that the American founding father, Jefferson, knew that the constitution was founded on the belief that God alone must rule the conscience in matters of religion. 
and she quotes from it from it from right she quotes from him here right there's the letter to the um right believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his god that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions i contemplate with sovereign reverence that that act of the whole american people which declared that their legislature should and he quote make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state thomas jefferson so god is behind the very rational amen sister anisa amen i see it god is behind the very rational of the first amendment so even if so when the guy says because the word god is not mentioned there it only has in the year of our lord it doesn't have god mentioned there the rationale behind the first amendment is because thomas jefferson he said it in the letter to the danbury baptist that the that religion is a matter that lies solely between man and his god and man owes account to none other for his faith or his worship and the legislative powers of government could only reach your actions only and not your opinions so therefore the very rational behind the first amendment is that no man no government no ruler should come between your worship to your god that must not be dictated by no one worship is between you and god it's a matter of conscience so the very rational behind the first amendment is about man's worship to god so you cannot say that the constitution is godless secular does not mean godless the rationale behind the first amendment acknowledges man's worship to his god man's conscience before god man's duty before god must not not be dictated by conscience god alone must rule the conscience god alone must dictate the conscience when it comes to religion not government so yes that man was being very deceitful and that's that's satan all all to say that listen the, the constitution don't have the principles of the social kingship of christ so therefore godless lie that is satan seeking to, to do away with the christ of the constitution the christ of republicanism to set up himself as a false christ a christ that is against religious liberty A Christ that wants to force you to worship him and not worship God alone. So it shows the principles behind the social kingship of Christ calls for the state to establish or legislate religion and religious dogmas. Yes. That is what it is calling for. Yes. And the and yes, Sister Ria, she, yeah, Sister Ria says I don't see any stinkness in this letter. Lauren Bull would call it a stinking letter. Excuse me, that's a social kingship of Christ attitude there, <laughs> right? So let's just we have to close off. So let's just close off with these quotations here. We want to show you. Listen, the daughters is heading on that same path that same path look at this here ellen g white great controversy page 588 and 589 as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal christianity of the day it has greater power to deceive and ensnare 
Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. So that guy in that video there that was speaking about the constitution, godless, no God there. It, it, it don't have the social the social kingship of Christ. I see it and concluded after the modern order of things. I see it and speaking there. In the name of religion, in the name of Christianity, in the name of Christ. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. But look at what Satan will do. This is the aim. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. And we saw in other quotations, like on Sabbath, for example, in the past few weeks that ourselves, Brother Medina, Sister Anissa, and they were using, showing that Satan will appear, he will impersonate Christ. So what? Mm. Because Satan himself, he is practicing the false justification there in that quote, eh? Because it says Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. But is he an angel of light? No. So look, you have a conversion that is only by work outwardly. Mm -hmm. Appearing as the angel of light, but he's not an angel of light. So his works, he appear that way. Mm -hmm. And he will perform as Brother Madida explained and went through. Or he will talk and how he will do miracles. Mm -hmm. All these works. So it shows us the false justification. He is the false Christ of the false justification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So watch what he would do. She says he will appear in the character of an angel of light through the agency of spiritualism. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits, as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church they will work sorry their work sorry their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power papist who boasts of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will readily be, be deceived by this wonder working power and Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. Hmm. Look at that. Them gone. The papists and Protestants, when Satan appears an angel of light and work miracles, they gone. That is, that is their false Christ that they will accept. And notice what she said about them. They cast away the shield of truth. That was their protection. She says, Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. <laughs> you see that? That? Is, that is the conversion after the modern order of things at that time. <laughs> False justification. So the same outward adjustment that you describe Satan as, as having when he come and he do all these things here, the papists and the protestants and the worldlings being deceived by all the miracles, they will make the same kind of outward adjustment too. So he can, he's the angel of light and they are ministers of righteousness. But who is the righteousness? They are, they, they are testifying of as ministers. Satan, Satan, the, Christ of, the fake Christ of righteousness. So, papists, protestants, and worldlings alike will accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the what? 
long expected millennium. Christ, some kind of kingdom set up down here for Christ. That is the future. Just this idea from of this millennium where the world will be converted. It shows a social kingship of Christ. A social kingship of Christ where the image of the beast is set up, the mark of the beast is enforced, everybody deceived by miracles, everybody make an outward adjustment at the form of godliness, everybody exalts Satan because he appears as an angel of light, he impersonates Christ, everybody accepts the false Christ. So look at that. Satan... The false Christ over a will of a false justification and a kingdom set up here, the millennium. That's what Satan is doing. Setting up his social kingship. That is the aim. Only this time he'll be using the daughters to the forefront. That is the aim. Satan is seeking to set up the social kingship of Christ, except he is the Christ that will be exalted. Again, watch this. Great Controversy 590-591. The miracle working power manifested through spiritualism will exert its influence against those who choose to obey God rather than man. Communications from the Spirit will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error. Hmm. Virginia, you can imagine this. Oh my God. You can imagine Satan's evil angels appearing as angels of light, communicating with these so called ministers of righteousness and telling them. That sending them coming to tell us, sorry, that we are wrong, we are in error for rejecting Sunday. And watch this affirming, she says, that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. Look at this part. They will lament the great wickedness in the world and second the testimony of religious leaders. So they'll be complaining about the evils going on in the world. They will lament the great wickedness in the world and second the testimony of religious leaders that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. I when you are you taking in the the um the the detailed workings of how this is going on be miracles, people deceived, everybody quote and unquote converted, evil angels telling them, pretending to be good angels, we telling them that we are in error. And we disobey the laws of God because the laws of the land is the laws of God. And the doctrine the social um, kingship of Christ. Eh? And they lament all the wickedness going on. And they are saying that these evils, the degraded state of morals, is caused by the desecration of Sunday. And people will be angry at us. Great will be the indignation excited against those who refuse to accept the testimonials of these evil spirits. Now, somebody tell me how not keeping Sunday causes the degraded state of morals. This will be the argument. The degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. But what fate... What faith is there, what scripture is there in the Bible 
that tells you to keep Sunday one and it, it lays out a, 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 um, a science for you to keep Sunday where you would not be practicing immorality. What faith is there behind Sunday that encourages morality? What keeping of Sunday encourages morality? There is no law, there is no rule, there is no science, there is no philosophy, no way in scripture that, that is moral or makes a person moral if they observe Sunday. Because when you look at Sunday keepers, Sunday exalters, because they can't, they can't keep Sunday, they get up. They dress like the world, they look like the world, they behave like the world, they are sinful like the world, they go to church for a few hours, they go home, and they do things that they would usually do during the week. They go shopping, they go playing sports, they go to the beach. They go and work. They go and play. Some of them go goes parties after. There is no um command to observe the hours in the day of Sunday in any way that encourages morality. The only thing God tells us to do, let's close up with some scriptures here. Because we have to close now, right? The only thing God tells us to do on Sunday is this year, Exodus chapter 20. Right? Exodus chapter 20. And verse 8 and 9. Exodus 20, 8 and 9, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9 says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And the beginning of verse 10 says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy God. So on the first, it says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. And that's what everybody does on a Sunday, work. But the Sabbath is the seventh day, and we are told in it we are not to do any work. But the Sabbath in Ezekiel chapter 20, if we go to Ezekiel chapter 20, the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification, of holiness. The Sabbath actually encourages morality. It's a sign of morality. So, not observing Sunday as a Sabbath or some kind of special day that is not responsible for the degraded state of morals. Right? Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. It says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Yahweh that sanctify them. Sanctify, set apart for holy use, to make holy. So the Sabbath is a sign that you have been sanctified by God, made pure, made holy, set aside for holy use. The very keeping of the Sabbath is a sign that you are moral. That you have morality. So therefore there is no way a Sabbath keeper could contribute to the degraded state of morals on the earth. Because if you look in Isaiah chapter 58... Isaiah chapter 58, the very, the very things that we have to do to keep the Sabbath, it includes the governing of even your thoughts. Isaiah 58 and verse 13. If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, call, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy of Yahweh honorable. 
and but look at the party and shall honor him not doing thine own ways people do their own things on a sunday but on the sabbath you can do your own ways nor finding thine own pleasure people all kind of pleasure seeking on a sunday but on the sabbath you can't be doing any pleasure seeking finding your own pleasure your pleasure is supposed to be in the truth right and it says no you're speaking thine own words no you obviously have to think before you speak so in the keeping of the sabbath you have you have to watch your thoughts you're very taught is guarded you're very taught how to be holy sanctified that encourages morality so no sabbath keeper could contribute to the degrading state of morals the problem with man is the carnal mind there's the problem with man the carnal mind romans chapter 8 let's let's go to romans chapter 8 right romans chapter 8 Verses 6 and 7. This is the problem of man. And there is no law, no government that could make a law to do something about this. Romans 8, 6 to 8, right? It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So the problem with man is he has the carnal mind. The carnal mind is death. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 shows that that there is dead in sin and trespasses. So that is the problem with man. He is dead in his sin and trespasses. He needs the spiritual mind. What law can a government pass to give you the spiritual mind? What keeping of Sunday? What going to church, church attendance on a Sunday could, what, how that giving you the spiritual mind? The giving of the spiritual mind is, is done by God. No law, no legislation, no observing Sunday could do that. Right? And notice the problem with the carnal mind, why it is, in, why it is dead in sin and trespasses. It is because it is not subject to the law of God. So the very first portion of scripture we started off with in first in Second Timothy chapter three, it shows it is breaking the law that caused the times to be perilous. So the degraded state of morals is because of the carnal mind that is in transgression of the law of God. So you cannot enforce a day. To encourage the man to continue breaking the law of God and expect to do something about the degraded state of morals. You encourage immorality. You encourage the degraded state of morals when you enforce Sunday. Sabbath keeping is what helps with the mora with morality on the earth. Because why? The man have to be converted. Have the spiritual mind to keep the law of God. And that is true conversion. And that, that conversion cannot be achieved through legislation. It could only be achieved by God changing the mind. Right? So we, we have to stop here. We have, I had like most portions of scripture to go to but we'll have to stop there for tonight because of the time right so if the brethren if you all have anything else to say we'll have to close off here now right so what we saw is that the social kingship of christ the aim of the evangelicals in pushing their idea of crisis king in politics is to bring back that very same social kingship of Christ in politics. 
it is to establish the very same religion of Rome. And when that happens, it will be done for the conversion of the world. But that conversion is not true conversion. It, it is an establishment of a global breaking of the law of God. So it's a conversion that includes breaking the law of God. No change. So the social kingship of Christ, when it is brought into politics, it, it actually causes a false justification. And therefore, a false Christ is exalted. A, it causes everybody who follows that enforcement of religion to have a false justification and therefore worship a false Christ. Yes, Brother Comey, go ahead. Right. I just want to quote one scripture in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. One minute here. All right. It tells us this. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So the issue with the angels was not the desecration of Sunday. It was sin. Right? It goes on. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the old world of the ungodly. Also, verse 6 will show you Sodom and the cities on the plain. So here you have God who will destroy the angels that sin. He destroyed the old world, the antediluvian world with the flood. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities on the plain. Not because of the desecration of Sunday. So the issue remains, sin is the problem. And sin is identified as the transgression of the law of God. Therefore, to legislate Sunday is to legislate transgression of the law of God. And that is what will bring the destruction of the world. So the point is, when you see the immorality in the world, it is not because of the desecration of Sunday, because you cannot desecrate Sunday. And yet, if that were to be true, you have to prove it with the angels. If that were to be true, you have to prove it with the antediluvian world. If that were to be true, you have to prove it with Sodom. It cannot be proven. The issue is the transgression of the law of God. Amen. So it is not the desecration of Sunday. Amen. Right? So brethren, at this juncture, we have to pause here. We have um, there are more things into um i had quotations looking at the temporal millennium looking at the catholic church was it this year right mrs white showing that rome hasn't changed 
and how she would be healed the protestants following in the same course we have to go through some portion of scriptures looking at righteousness by works and presumption versus righteousness by faith but to begin that part now it it, it will be too late and it will carry us even way past 12. so we'd have to continue find a way to fit it in on next time we come on right so we will close here for tonight by god's grace right so let us close here with a word of prayer right let us pray loving merciful father which art in heaven we thank you for showing us these principles regarding republicanism and your workings behind the certain of Republican republicanism to fight against Satan exalting himself as a false Christ to the medium of the papacy to the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ we we have seen you as providential king and subjective king in the setting up of republicanism we thank you for showing us any prophecies that the apostate protestants are pursuing the same course to again set up satan as a false christ with the idea of this christ is king Christ being a social king doctrine in politics and what it will cause the false conversion that it will bring upon the world causing the entire world to worship Satan as a false Christ whilst everyone has a false experience everyone has the experience of a false justification help us to prepare to face these things with the two angels message with an experience of the third angel's message as described in revelation 14 and verse 12 being justified by faith having righteousness by faith which is manifest in keeping the commandments of god because that is the only answer to a false justification and a false christ so please help us to have that experience now make us free from sin now help us to have all times sinfulness. Sinfulness as a habit at all times. So we could be properly prepared to face the events that we have to face. These are the mercies that we ask of you. In your holy name we pray. To the truth of the plan of salvation. Amen. Okay, so. Grace and peace everyone. You will see us on Thursday night. We will continue. Until next time, may God be with you. Bye. Peace and peace and bye.